introduction. Um, and I hope that my presentation will go some way to answering some of the questions that um, the session chairs have posed to us. Um, so this is based on my uh, master's dissertation that I did at uh, the University of York. I'm now a PhD student at Durham University, hence kind of dual affiliation here. Um, so a quick uh, overview of what I'll be talking about today. Um, I'll first give an introduction into Paleolithic personal ornaments um, and the issues that I feel uh, sort of emerge from past approaches to personal ornaments in the Paleolithic. I'll then discuss uh, the relational approach I employed and developed in my research, um, which integrated three different strands um, into the approach. So ethnography, uh, relational theory, and experimental archaeology. I'll then quickly discuss how I applied this um, to one of my case studies, uh, saint germain le riviere and then finally conclude with some implications I feel um, for this relational approach to studying objects a bit more broadly. So, um, for anyone who's not familiar, uh, personal ornaments in the Paleolithic are quite a pervasive phenomenon. Um, they potentially emerged with Homo erectus around 200,000 years ago, although this evidence is contentious. Um, but we now know definitely that uh, Neanderthals have personal ornaments 115,000 years ago, and this kind of trend continues throughout the Paleolithic, um, becoming more diverse with the range of materials used. Um, right up until the end of the Magdalenian. And of course, with this huge temporal breadth comes a breadth of different interpretations. Um, with debates surrounding whether these objects were used for social inequality, whether they were a system of communication, whether they were uh, symbolic or ritualized objects, or whether they were merely embellishments and decorative uh, items. Now, as you can see, um, this covers a huge uh, breadth, but the, we're really missing the, the personalised aspects of personal ornaments. Um, out of the publications I uh, reviewed, only 5% discuss identity. And I think that's problematic. These are personalised ornaments. They're worn on the body. How are only 5% of the research discussing uh, identity? And also there's this trend against using analogy. And we still appear to be in this mindset of reactions against analogy that Wiley discusses in 1985. So where does this really leave us in terms of understanding personal ornaments? We're kind of in a void of nothingness <laughs> um, with no understanding about these objects. Or at best, we have a bead suspended within this void. Um, it's bounded and isolated from past hunter-gatherer uh, hunter lifeways. And we might try and approach this object from this void uh, and describe it. It's a shell, it's perforated, it's ochred. We might measure it. Um, but is that really the best that we can do? And I argue not. So how do we avoid this void? Um, well, just to summarize really uh, the issues with past approaches, personal ornaments in these powerful, socially charged contexts remain passive objects, merely reflecting uh, pre-existing information. Now this perhaps emerges from a lack of using ethnography. So only 2% of the literature I looked at had an explicit ethnographic focus, which means that our Western perceptions aren't being challenged. We're seeing objects from a very Westernized uh, perception. Additionally, only 10% of the literature explicitly had an experimental focus. And this means that we're not appreciating the life history and the materiality of these objects. So there's a real need, therefore, to integrate all of these uh, different types of analogy within a novel framework. And that's exactly what I tried to do by rafting these things together to form my own relational approach. Now, and I'll discuss each of these sections uh, with a bit more depth. So the first strand of my relational approach aimed to challenge uh, Western, educated, industrial, rich and democratic, or weird, uh, perspectives of objects. Um, and Western perceptions uh, seem to see objects in general um, as quite static and um, in a dichotomy with persons and, uh, yeah, with persons. Um, where we're separated from the manufacture process 
of objects. They're replaceable, they're meaningless. And we might see that we can become attached to objects through object attachment theory, but that's about it. So there's a real need to challenge this approach. And so I used a breadth of ethnographic analogy. I looked at 104 different examples of personal ornaments from 29 societies to try and challenge this Western perception. And uh, I drew out some broad trends here that you can see. And I think uh, they're all sort of summarized by this really interesting personal ornament that I came across in my research, which is um, an Andamanian human collarbone ornament. And this shows how objects uh, can challenge this idea of an object human boundary. So this uh, is a human collarbone uh, from a deceased person. It's packed with clay to maintain the heat and smell of the object, and that imbues the object with its power in this society. And you can see there are some shells attached to that. That maintains the um, original person's identity. So it's still a person, but it's an object, and that's what gives it its power within this uh, society. But how can we use this ethnography and build it into a lens in which to um, perceive objects in the past? This is where I drew on uh, current <coughs> relational theories, um, starting with Ingalls' idea of a meshwork. Now, this arg argues that objects are active and entangled. Um, they're not a node within a sort of um, within a network that can be removed, but they're uh, constructed through uh, these different relations and processes of becoming. So these relations are constantly being negotiated and formed and renegotiated throughout the object's life. I then looked a little bit deeper and used uh, Hodder's entanglement theory that concerns, in my opinion, the relations uh, between things within a meshwork. So it's just looking at a different um, perspective of this meshwork and uh, arguing that uh, these relations are looking at the specifics of these relations and how they're formed. And finally, I looked at object biography, which I feel is the key to kind of unpicking this meshwork when we look at objects. This concerns the strands that are being imbued within uh, objects throughout their lives and accessing the uh, meshwork through that during Ongarsson and Marshall's work. But how can we practically access this? It's all well and good talking about the theory, but we're archaeologists. We need to understand the objects themselves. And I argue this is where experimental archaeology comes to the fore. The uh, ethnography and um, relational theory uh, really exemplifies how object biographies are important. And experimental archaeology can access object biographies by testing hypotheses pertinent to understanding the object biographies. This allows for a much more grounded approach in the archaeological evidence. And also means we're not kind of trying to conceptualize a bunch of relations all at once, but we can create this relational constellation, as Van Oyen uh, puts it, where we're tracing the relations of objects that are imbued throughout their lives. So that's a quick summary of my approach. I applied this to two case studies, and I'll talk about this one um, today. So uh, I applied it to beads from Saint-Germain-la-Rivière. This is um, an early Magdalenian site with a calibrated radiocarbon date of around 18,000 years ago. Um, it's an adult female burial with approximately 70 uh, red deer uh, teeth associated to it. These teeth are orchids and have a unique decoration on. And um, in the original excavation reports, appear to have been strung along um, the neck and wrist. Um, but it hasn't really been uh, studied that much. Van Aaron and the Erica have kind of been the most recent people to look at this, um, arguing that these are representative of um, social inequality in the Magdalenian. So I applied my relational approach to try and understand these objects to more depth, primarily through tracing their object biography. So first I tried to understand where these objects were acquired from. Um, so saint germain de rivière is uh, situated here, here, there we go. Um, 
in France. And during this period, uh, it's an open steppe-like environment, and there's very little evidence of red deer in the archaeological record here. It actually accounts for less than 0.1% of the faunal record. So where are they getting all this red deer teeth from? So the closest region really is uh, 300 kilometres away in Spain, where some uh, dispersed woodland can support uh, forest adapted species such as red deer. Um, and this already shows a much more interesting narrative to these objects. They're being um, acquired from long distance and perhaps represent, therefore, uh, social networks and social interaction across this uh, landscape. I then looked at how these objects are being produced. And now, anyone who's eagle-eyed might have noticed in the uh, original images that there's quite a lot of variation in the perforation morphology. So I tried to understand how this uh, variation could have emerged and exploring authorship through this. Um, and use experimental archaeology as a way to do this. So I tested hypotheses relating to uh, skill level, drill size, root thickness, and none of them could account for this variation. So it appears that this variation is emerging uh, intentionally, and therefore there's perhaps multiple authors working on these beads. And this is corroborated by it taking about an hour to produce each bead too. Now, where was very difficult to look at uh, in this research, um, it's literally given about a sentence in the uh, Van Heren and Dierico publication, where they say there's no wear on the beads. Um, so I tried to explore what wear uh, could have, um, how much wear was required to uh, produce recognisable polish in the perforation, and only an hour was uh, sufficient to do this. So it may have been the case that these objects are being produced deliberately for the burial. I then looked at the decoration and the ochring of these objects. And this is really where experimental archaeology, I think, can reveal some very interesting insights about these objects. So they have notch decoration on, uh, just produced by a sharp blade. And as you can see in the left image, you can't really, uh, this isn't visible on the tooth when you produce it. Only a macro photo can sort of uh, pick it out, but from a distance you wouldn't notice that this decoration is on the bead. But as soon as you apply ochre, the object is transformed and the decoration is pulled out and become, uh, becomes visible um, to the viewer. So these objects are being intentionally produced to look unique and to be unique. So to summarise, we're having deconstructed objects uh, deconstructed aspects of humans in the form of the perforation variation and the notch decoration in the ochre, combined with deconstructed parts of deer, which are being fused together to form a sort of deer-human hybrid, which is already an interesting insight in terms of identity and how people are negotiating their identity through these objects. But they're then being strung together as a meta-object and associated to just one person. And this is revealed only through this relational approach. So to conclude, um, this relational approach has really pertinent implications for understanding personal ornaments, not as isolated and bounded from uh, past hunter-gatherer lives, but very active and entangled within them. And this has implications for our conceptualization of these objects <coughs> in the past and for the benefits of using an integrated um, use of analogy. And of course, no study is perfect, and there's a whole host of future work that needs to be done. But I really want to pick out um, having primary access to these objects. Imagine if I was able to have, instead of looking at secondary literature, but have access to these objects and develop my hypotheses about the experimental archaeology through direct observation. I think much more nuanced insights would be uh, revealed through that. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I just want to thank uh, Northern Bridge for paying me to be here. Um, my wonderful uh, dissertation supervisor, Andy Needham, who you'll hear from next, and the Year Centre at York, um, particularly Amy Little and Andy Langley as well. Thank you. <laughs>